the child may come with anemia. So common manifestations of hepatomegalia are jaundice, anemia, clay stools if there is obstruction, bleeding tendency, edema and ascites, encephalopathy, fever and pruritus. So these are the common manifestations. So if we see this, something like this, think of a liver problem. If we see, we see anemia and all that, we think of a clinic problem. So how to identify the problem? Now when the patient comes to you, you may, you may find there is an isolated spleen or you may find that there is an isolated liver or both the liver and the spleen are enlarged. Now if such a patient comes to you, how do we identify? So what are the things that we need to look for? <coughs> Commonest cause of spleen enlarging is reticular endothelial system. That means infection inflammation. So fever. The other commonest cause is extramedullary hematopoiesis. So anemia. And third is a liver disease or anemia causing indirect jaundice. So jaundice. So these are the three things you should look for. Fever, anemia and jaundice. Now if the child has any of these in combinations, you have to think what it is. So splenomegaly may come to you as anemia. It may come to you as fever with splenomegaly. It may come to you as splenomegaly with hematemesis. Or it may be just nothing, no symptoms. Just you incidentally found an isolated splenomegaly. Now, if it comes as splenomegaly with anemia, that means either the spleen is breaking down to the RBCs or bone marrow is not creating the RBCs, so there is a problem. So, either there is increased destruction of RBCs. Increased destruction when you look at hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, hypersplenic. Extramedullary hematopoiesis has started taking place. That's the reason why that anemia was there. Again, causes. Hemologic anemia, autoimmune hemologic anemia, iron deficiency. Blood loss is occurring due to bleeding. Then you know this splenomegaly with anemia is there. If bleeding is occurring, that means either it's hypersplenism or it's portal hypertension or child has got leukemia because there are no platelets being formed for the normal. So when I see splenomegaly with anemia, these are the causes I will keep in mind. That's your Hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, tropical splenomegaly, portal hypertension disease. So these are the things that, and if I think logically, I understood. Now if a child comes splenomegaly with anemia, either bone marrow is not coming, spleen is destroyed, or there is some infiltrate in the bone marrow, so nothing. Or he is lost somewhere, the blood. So either he is bleeding from the GI tract, malina, hematomas. So these are the only common causes that I will get spleen with anemia. Now if I get spleen with fever, that means, yeah. If I get spleen with fever, that means there is an infection or there is inflammation, reticular endothelial system. So spleen with fever, common cause is malaria in our setup. Malaria not responding, spleen with fever persisting, think of Brazil, it's not uncommon. And especially as per history of drinking unpasteurized milk. Lot of infants are given tabela milk without bothering. And that's the commonest cause of Brazil. And it's not that uncommon. So if you get a picture just like malaria but not responding, think of Brucella. Colors are, you have to ask, as we come from Bihar, as we come from Western Delhi, we don't see it in Maharashtra. But any child with anemia, fever going on and on and on, and you get a spleen, think of colors. Infectious mononuclear uh, onset, which is a current onset. So infectious mononuclear is fever. Splenomegaly, lymph nodes. Child looks toxic in 4 to 5 days period. So that is infectious mononucleosis. Rickettsia, classically you see the rash. That rash is so uh, rampant. It's right from head to toe. It's a hemorrhagic kind of a rash that you would see. And you can ask whether there was a bite. Sometimes they tell you the history of a bite. So if you see a rash, fever and anemia, think of uh, they get sick. Infective endocarditis, usually you have an underlying heart problem. So it's not something that you pick up de novo. There'll be an underlying heart problem and you can pick that up. HIV, one should never ignore. We pick up a lot of patients with just fever and splenomegaly being HIV. So anything not responding. So you don't send HIV on day one of illness. You send HIV when you find that you're working. After one week, nothing working. After two weeks, nothing working. Think of HIV. Okay, don't think of it right at day one. But obviously 
disseminated TV. Disseminated TV, other things will be there. Child will be malnourished, there will be liver spleen, very wasted child. Then you think of disseminated TV. Not in an otherwise healthy living child. Now you can have splenomegaly with hematomasis. When you have splenomegaly with hematomasis, only one thing. Portal Rarely you will get splenomegaly with hematomasis without portal hypertension in a chronic liver disease. Chronic liver disease, bleeding, clotting factors are not there. There are no varices as yet. But he bled and he bled through the GI. So if you get this, think of portal hypertension or chronic liver disease without portal hypertension. If you just pick up a spleen, we often pick this knot. In fact, parents come to you, we find that the left side is enlarged. They actually feel that knot. So they may just come to you as lump in abdomen. And lump in abdomen without fever, without anemia, without hematomasis. It's just isolated spleen. Now when you get this, what are you supposed to think of? Think of HIV. Think of portal hypertension who's not bled as yet. So he's not, you've caught him before he bled. So that is what is going to happen. Think of tropical splenomegaly, hereditary spherocytosis. Adults can just come with lung and they will not have anything. So you must work them up for hereditary spherocytosis. There will obviously a story in this one. So if you just get an isolated lump, these are the things you have to think of. HIV, extra hepatic portal hypertension, tropical splenomegaly, hereditary spherocytosis and storage disorder. What happens when you just get a liver? There is only a liver enlarged, but there is no spleen enlarged. Now, only liver enlarged, you can have coming with you with jaundice, liver and jaundice. You can get hepatomegaly with clay stools. You can get hepatomegaly with hypoglycemia. You can get hepatomegaly with ascites, bleeding manifestation. Hepatomegaly with enteropathy. Hepatomegaly with anemia. Or hepatomegaly as just a lump. Now, what would you do if you get hepatomegaly with jaundice? What is the thing I am thinking of? Because liver is not functioning properly, it's getting jaundice. Not functioning, detoxification not taking place. So what is the problem? Either detoxification not taking place or acute or chronic epidemics. Or excretion is not taking place. So obstructive death. So if I get hepatomegaly with jaundice, I think of these three. Acute hepatitis, chronic hepatitis and obstructive hepatitis. If I get hepatomegaly with ascites, that means liver is not able to produce Albumin. If liver is not able to produce albumin, that means it's a long-standing liver problem. So, chronic <coughs> liver disease. Sometimes when we get hepatomegaly with ascites in an otherwise normal cell, this could be dengue. But with dengue, I would have expected fever. So, without fever, chronic liver disease. With fever, dengue. With more fever, septicemia. And isolated hepatomegaly with ascites, never forget bacteria. This is one thing that we must keep in mind. So if there is no other features of liver cell failure and you just got hepatomegaly with ascites, you think of bacteria. You get hepatomegaly with anemia. Again, it's a problem. Either the bone marrow is not forming or liver has started producing. So hemolytic anemia, Wilson's disease, megaloplastic anemia, chronic liver can also cause anemia and leukemia. Isolated hepatomegaly. You didn't find anything, just a lump. Either we missed the acute hepatitis and now the child is recovering. You may just have presented a diarrhea and it was a subacute acute hepatitis and we picked it up. So resolving acute hepatitis. Or maybe it's a chronic liver who's compensated currently. So chronic liver disease or it's a storage. So when you get just isolated hepatomegaly, these are the things we have to think of. Whenever we think of isolated hepatomegaly, this is something that we've been learning right from our undergraduate days. Uh, look for the feel of the liver, look whether it is tender or non-tender, look at the borders, see whether the left lobe is palpable or not. So what are we trying to achieve? Tender hepatomegaly. Why would we get tenderness? Tenderness comes because capsule is getting stretched. So when would the capsule get stretched? Either liver is getting filled with something. That means suddenly the liver is getting filled with something. A storage disorder is slowly progressing filling stage. So capsule will not throw a pain. But now the liver has started filling up very fast. So fluid. So fluid in the liver filled up very fast. Constructive pericarditis. Congestive cardiac failure. Liver filled up very fast. That's how we pick up CCF. Tender hepatomegaly. Why? Because the fluid filled up very fast. Second, liver enlarged fast. 
When will the liver enlarge past? A few different So you would get a tenderness by the way. So these are the two things. What are liver abscess? Again, tenderness. So if you get tender, think of acute problems. Acute like fluid or inflammation or infection and an abscess. Non-tender means liver is okay. It's not an acute problem. Now you've got a liver which is soft, firm or hard. Many have a soft liver. Soft means either the liver has still not been stretched over a period of time. So when we get a soft liver, it's been something that has occurred recently. So again, acute hepatitis. Soft liver means something soft is in the liver. So fat. So fatty liver. Firm liver. Firm liver means liver enlarged and it's remained for, uh, enlarged for some time. So now, by now, the compliance of the liver has become less. So it's firm. So chronic liver. So firm liver is chronic liver. Hard liver. Liver has become like a rock. Yes, sir. Just two days back I did a biopsy in a liver patient who was five and a half months old. And when I put in that needle, it felt like I was hitting into a rock. It was that hard. So even before we went for the histopathy, we knew this was cirrhosis. So hard liver, cirrhosis. Now why do we need to clean the borders? Borders are rounded, well felt or leaky. Rounded borders means liver is enlarged and it's filled with something. That's why it's got rounded. So, storage disorder, fluid in the liver, so again congestive cardiac failure will give you a rounded border. So, these are the causes. So, fluid is there or storage is there? Now, you get a well-felt liver. Well-felt means again, the borders you are feeling it well. So, something long-standing, chronic liver. Leaky liver, now the borders have started becoming like this. Cirrhosis, liver shape is changing. So cirrhosis. So leaky liver is cirrhosis. Surface is smooth and nodular. The only two things that you can make out from this is if it's nodular, it's cirrhosis. If it's not nodular, it is not cirrhosis. It cannot help you to differentiate between acute and chronic hepatitis. And left lobe palpable. Sometimes you know we get a liver which is palpable, but it's not actually enlarged. It's just a push down liver. The child may have had bronchiolitis and the liver got pushed down. So how do we identify? If left lobe is palpable, there is a problem in the liver. So left lobe helps us to identify that it's not just a push down liver, the liver is actually enlarged. Now there will be uh, in the problems where we talk about isolated splenomegaly, we talk about isolated hepatomegaly. Now we talk about hepatospinomegaly occurring together. So when will both of them enlarge together? If there is an infection, there is anemia, extramedullary hematopoiesis. It's a chronic liver with portal hypertension, malignancy or storage. So infection, they will come as fever, anemia, jaundice. These are the problems. If he had infection, he would have come with fever. If it was extramedullary hematopoiesis, he would have come with anemia. If it's a chronic liver, he would have come as jaundice. So hepatosplenomegaly, how do we approach? Look for fever or no fever. If there is fever, look for anemia, jaundice. No anemia, no jaundice. No fever, anemia jaundice, no anemia no jaundice. So this is the chart that we need to follow. So what are the three things that we need to look for? Fever, anemia and jaundice. These are the things we have to look for and identify. Now if we take the first one, that is fever, hepatosplenomegaly, fever and jaundice. That means there is something acute affecting the reticular endothelial system or it is something causing like an acute hepatitis. So acute hepatitis, chronic liver with decompensation, infection with septicemia, malaria, dengue, brucella, palaza, leptospine. So if you remember that way, it's easier for us to remember. Fever means reticular endothelial system or an infection. Jaundice means liver is not functioning. So acute hepatitis, chronic hepatitis. That's how we came to our differential diagnosis. If we have hepatosplenia with fever and anemia, because there is fever, Reticular endothelial system. So malaria, brucella, calaza, infectious pneumonia, rickettsia, infectious all this. Because there is anemia, two cell lines involved, think of malignancy and autoimmune. So with fever, we always think of reticular endothelial system. Now, with fever, but no jaundice, no anemia. Again, reticular endothelial system. Same cause. Hepatosplenomegaly without fever. Now there is no fever, just jaundice. So there is no fever. So your reticular endothelial system is out. 
So hepatitis pneumomegaly with jaundice is just acute hepatitis from hepatitis. Hepatitis pneumomegaly without fever but there is anemia. So it's a problem only of anemia, liver and spleen and all that. So extra medullary hematopoiesis. Hemolytic anemia, leukemia, sometimes portal hypertension with a bleed. Megalognostic anemia due to chronic liver disease and HIV due to fever. Both liver and spleen getting embarrassed from the HIV. Hepatitis pneumonia, just hepatitis pneumonia, nothing in the child, no fever, no anemia, no jaundice. So what is the cause? HIV, chronic liver disease, stolen disease. So this becomes important. So if you remember fever, causes of fever in liver and spleen, reticular endothelial system, acute hepatitis, autoimmune. If you think of anemia, extramedullary hematopoiesis or a bleed. And if you are thinking of jaundice, either detoxification not occurring or excretion not occurring. If we remember that way, this chart becomes easier to remember. And we can tackle any hepatosplenomegaly patient that comes to us. So whenever we are dealing with hepatosplenomegaly, look for fever, anemia, jaundice. Three things you have to look for. And accordingly come to a diagnosis. And look whether it's isolated liver, it's isolated spleen, or both are enlarged. Now this will become much clearer to you when we go to the grand rounds. Grand rounds are based on this lecture, where we are going to take each individual case of hepatitis pneumonia and see how to approach them. But this is what I'm trying to emphasize that we need to remember it in this way. Fever, anemia, jaundice. Fever, reticular endothelial system, acute hepatitis. Anemia, extramedullary hematopoiesis, or bleeding from somewhere, or spleen is destroyed. And jaundice. Jaundice means liver is not able to conjugate, or liver is not able to throw it out. So these are the things that we need to remember it that way, and we'll be able to identify every patient of hepatitis B. Any questions right now? Everyone had one meter and <laughs> got little, uh, no hypoglycemia. Yes. How do you examine this child who was less than one year non perfect How do you examine it, you mean to say? Yeah. For a liver thing is crying? Yeah. Uh, actually, this is the best time to examine this child. This child is crying. What happens is, uh, when the child is crying, and when he takes a breath while he's crying, so they tend to take a very deep inspiration. That is the time you put in your hand inside the apple. And you can actually see the breath. So whenever the child is crying, try and palpate with his crying uh, cells. And whenever he's taking a breath in, palpate. Again, whenever he's taking a breath in, palpate. That's how you do it. And this will be very easy to pick up because the liver will be pushed down. So you can actually pull the liver. And you say, without fever, exo-deprecated in the one of the causes. Yes. So but there will be a past history of fever in that There may But currently when you are seeing the child, that there may be no but the past history we ask then it may be it may be okay uh, I think uh, we stop here we will have more discussion in the grand round because that is more practice it will be actually case based so we will go further